Hi again, Mark here from Talking Bass. This week I'm sitting down to talk bass with the amazing solo bass pioneer, Steve Lawson. Steve is unlike any other bass player you're likely to hear. He uses a combination of looping, bass effects and triggers to create incredible soundscapes and textured melodic journeys that wouldn't seem out of place in an epic motion picture soundtrack. We talked about things as diverse as the rhythmic influence of hip hop, improvisation as a compositional process and the great role that Bandcamp plays in marketing for the modern musician. We also take a look at Steve's approach to looping and effects as he demonstrates his approach, bass in hand. So get ready for a hugely inspiring chat with a true original in the world of bass guitar, Mr. Steve Lawson. One minute, I feel like I'm watching a Ridley Scott sci-fi epic. <laughs> and the next minute, I'm listening to D'Angelo swimming in a sea of music concrete. What do you think Ooh, of that? Does that, does that, that yeah. describe it? <laughs> absolutely. I mean, the D'Angelo reference is absolutely bang on. The Ridley's, I mean, the, the funny thing about film soundtracks is that I've never, I haven't spent much time listening to film music outside of films. Like, I'm obviously hyper-responsive to music in films, as we all are. Yeah. Um, but like the the one that that often came up was 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 Blade Runner, which was Van mm. Gallis, wasn't it? Uh, which yeah. I, I I saw on a plane recently for the first time, and people would go, "Oh God, you must be so influenced by that." And I was going, "No, I get that there's a parallel, and I think I think part of that is because when I do do kind of big pad type sounds, I do a lot of atmospheric stuff. Mm. It it kind of almost by default sounds like analog synths rather than digital ones, like it has, yeah. because because its origin is even though it's digital processing in the sense that I'm using reverbs and delays that are digitally generated. It's, it's an analog signal, but the, the D'Angelo thing is key because, because D'Angelo was, was, I mean, or Questlove and Pino on Voodoo were basically trying to channel the work of a, of a hip hop producer called Jay Diller, yeah. who uh, totally upended the way that we think about rhythm in, in popular music. I mean, it's, there's so much that happens now where you go, oh, that's, that, that's that Diller beat. And if you talk to producers like referencing Diller, like it, sometimes people are just like, oh, that's great. And that's amazing. But everybody knows exactly what you mean. Yeah. And it is that move away from metric time. And I think yeah. that there's an awful lot that's happening in bass playing at the moment that is actually about a, a shift back to that metric thing, that there is the, the, a lot of the quote unquote funk stuff that's happening now is actually very, very kind of square and on the grid, a bit like the eighties, like kind of, mm. because I think when sequencing first came in and when editing possibilities were kind of being expanded, people were like, almost like it was like an experiment, like how, how much can we make this sound like a machine? Mm. And, and, and bands like level 42 were using a combination of synth bass and live bass. So there wasn't that much room to move either way. Cause at the time sequences didn't allow you to deviate and, you know, click tracks were a fairly recent thing at that point that if you listen to, I don't know, a band like The Police, everything's moving all over the place. Yeah. And then three or four years later, you've got Level 42 and everything is bang on. And it's because there were clicks in the studio and they were suddenly... So that our whole concept of time evolved to this metric thing. And then Dilla happened and hip hop in particular, I think turntablism had this in it as well, that there's there is an inherent kind of mashing up of rhythm that happens when you take a beat that was originally played and a lot of them are, again the 70s kind of bunk break beats which are, are quite loose yeah. but then you also have the time that it takes the guy to spin it back and let it go and so every dj had their own feel and so the, our the popular concept of what rhythm was and what it did shifted through the late 80s early 90s because of hip-hop but there has been the shift back so bands like Snarky Puppy and Wolfpack and things. There's there's this very kind of like 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 there's this the shift back to sort of quite electronic time, and that, I don't think this is necessarily a bad thing, but it just it's that that we've now come to this place where Dilla was was machines emulating human feel, and now we've got humans emulating machine feel. Yeah, and it's kind of it's fascinating. I mean, and in some in some cases it's mind blowing. I mean, Henrik Lender is just like yeah you know it has this extraordinary sense of time and and an ability to sell things and then and players like tim lafave and robin malarkey and sam wilkes doing that whole kind of again it's 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 i don't know where that started was it no. was it um who's the drummer that yannick played with him um oh uh, a bit a little um jojo yeah jojo, jojo Mayer. Mayer. Yeah, yeah yeah so I, I, I think he kind of was quite 
like a nerve is his band. I yeah, think that was it, I think yeah. that was quite influential. And obviously, when Square Pusher put together his first iteration of a live act, yeah, there was some of that. But that and what that's grown into with bands like Noah and the stuff that um, the Pomplamoose guys are doing with with whatever their spin-off project is with Sam on bass. That there's a lot of kind of really really interesting electronic acoustic hybrid and somewhere in the middle of that or, or kind of off to the side of it kind of in a cafe on his own is me things that I always loved about looping was that, that it has its own sense within it. So if you loop something that's completely out of time, I mean, I'll do it because I've got a bass here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I loop something that goes... Mm. It only needs to go around a couple of times before all of that weirdness makes sense. And if yeah, I yeah. overdub onto that... You know, that, that, that initially you're going, whoa, it feels slightly seasick. The repetition makes sense of the chaos. Ah, that's a very good way of putting it. That's a really, that's a very good phrase. <laughs> that, that sounds like I said it. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, absolutely. And that's what it is. And, and I think that, that for me, that, that that was a huge part of what drew me to looping was that, that again, at the time, late 90s when I started doing it, a lot of people were trying to loop and still are. They still do looping and try and make it mechanical. But the problem with that is that in terms of the audience response to it, once they know what's going on, once there's no surprises in it at all, and in your relationship with that loop, it becomes a backing track that they yeah. get pushed to the back of their kind of experiential thing. And they and what they hear is you playing over the top, and it might as well at that point be a CD. One of the great things about seeing a band is the is the thought that it might all fall apart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When a band is exceptionally well rehearsed, like. You, you can be wowed by the scale of it, but there is none of that danger. You, what, I, what I love to see is a band on a knife edge. Yeah. And when it does fall apart occasionally, I mean, I, the, the best example of this, I think, was going to see Katie Tunstall at the iTunes Festival, probably 12, 13 years ago, um, something like that. And uh, she was playing at Air Studios and she started playing, she, was, she had a little loop pedal there and she started playing Black Horse and the Cherry Tree, which is the one that don't, yeah. don't, 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 starts with that kind of Bo Diddley scratch thing. And she screwed it up. And she went, all right, sorry, I'll start again. And we went, oh, that's really cute. Because she'd obviously at that point played it a thousand times. Like it was her signature tune. People love it. They love the cock-ups. Exactly. And she did. She caught up like five times around and she went, oh, F it. I'm going to do something else. Yeah. And uh, and nobody went, that. I want my money back. This is unprofessional. This yeah. is to, Everybody will remember that now. Yeah, yeah. As the moment where we all went, oh, you're so sweet. This is lovely. Yeah. You're just real. You're like us. Do you have a preconceived idea of something or is it just pure? improvisation do you have a, a mood do you have a phrase do you have you know a, a, just an idea a form an arc of the form or yeah. is it pure improv I think I mean I think what I have is I have a set of possibilities that there are affordances within the gear that I use for a certain kind of structure mm. and I, I'm constantly pushing against those so I so I, I have this constant uh, conversation with constraint and possibility Mm. So the constraints are the toys that I have here and the fact that I've decided that I will record everything live. There, there was a quote I once read in a book that said that uh, an album, like a, a normally produced album, is a copy with no original. That we're making this thing that is constructed as a, as a, as a, a thing that is a simulation of a sound that is in somebody's head. So there is yes. no, it's not yeah. like they, we, we recreate something, we create something, but it's not, it's not a, a it's not the original artifact. It is a copy. It's a duplication yeah. of an, a set of ideas. Whereas for me, I didn't. I, I I can't do that. I can't conceive ahead of time of what I do. When I do, when I've tried to do that, it comes out like TV themes. Like yeah, I kind yeah. of end up sounding like, oh, he's just rewritten the tune to the bill. Yeah, yeah. Because because the, for me that that the complexity of improv, the fact that things end up getting put together that I couldn't think of being able to put together, 
I can't. I don't understand the rhythms that are going on a lot of my stuff. I just want to lose some of that rhythmic, uh, like uh, the organic rhythm that you've got in there. Because if you were, it, it's very much like if you come up with an idea, the first time you come up with it, you could say that's the improvised moment. The more that you play that, the more that you do that, the rhythm becomes more. You know, like you were saying about metronomically sort of quantized in yeah. a way, it kind of does that in your own brain. So you end up with this polished version of what this phrase might be. Whereas the original raw or organic mm. phrase is the one that you really want. And there's, there's often yeah. even all the little problems in there and stuff. It's the beauty in that. And I'm guessing you're going for that. And the, exactly. And I think this happens in every form that there are, that there is a fascination with Picasso sketches. And, and line drawings by Dali and things because there's something essential about when someone does that. So when you're, you're talking about this, this kind of liminal space between composition and improvisation, on one level, everything is completely improvised, but we can then get into what improvisation is because I think there is this idea that improvising is playing things you've never played before. Mm. And it's not in the same way that conversation isn't about making up words. Oh, yeah. Like you don't go, oh, I can't use those rules of grammar because I've, I've talked in the past tense before. <laughs> that would be repeating myself. I must just make up weird space noises. Yeah, make up words. Yeah, that's right. Blah, 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 blah. What, what's that? Well, it's new. It's novel. Yeah, but it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, but nobody's done it before. Because you sound like an idiot. That's why yeah. nobody else did it. One of the things I've been thinking about recently is the fact that for most improvisers, most of the conversation around improv is about the creative person's intent and this desire to to tap into something of themselves and express it and very little of it is about the audience yeah. and their place within that and their experience of that and we kind of see them as this sort of that they're that again it's kind of weird because it, when interviews go on about improvisers they go yeah well, the audience influences what's going on but they don't talk about getting into dialogue about that and i want to talk to my audience about that so yeah i'm very I, i'm very responsive to who's in the space and who I'm playing to. And when I'm well, like, so again, as a subscriber, you will have had all of the film of all four tracks of the new album. Mm. And, and what I do is I stick a camera exactly where this camera is now. Hello, you are being my film. Um, and I film what I'm doing and I don't, I don't gesture to the camera. I'm not going, good evening subscribers, watch this. Because it's just that third person observer of what, of what I'm doing. I'm trying to demystify it in a way. Um, but also that being there, makes me super conscious of the subscribers as my audience. That's the thing I liked most about the Bandcamp model. Um, just the very fact that, like, subscribing to you, you get this kind of personal connection in a way because mm. there's, you know, you're always putting out various posts and all this kind of stuff. And it's, it's, a, it's a much, well, I mean, it's... There's no comparison, really. I mean, especially financially from the, you know, with Spotify. I mean, it's, you know, th there's just no comparison. But I was really, really, especially with your subscription, I was really, really impressed by how that worked. Um, mm. And especially with the amount of content that's in there. I mean, it's ridiculous. But it's, as far as I can see, based on, on especially with the way you do it, Bandcamp mm. is definitely the better of the platforms, for the artist especially. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because I, I think there are a number of different subscription models out there, and Patreon is obviously a big one, yeah. and and it's much broader than just music. You can I I support a couple of writers, and I support an academic on Patreon because he's writing about stuff that I'm nicking and quoting in my PhD, and so I wanted him to keep doing that. Um, but but Patreon doesn't actually deal with audio in as as respectful a way as as yeah. Bandcamp. I think one thing I love about Bandcamp is that I don't. I don't feel any sense that I need to keep going like, oh, here's free cakes and here's an offer for this thing. And here's, I, I'm not selling uh, the, the, and the fact that I put out 10 albums, a, um, like last, the last 12 months I put out 10 albums. That's not the Bandcamp offer. The Bandcamp offer is two public albums and two subscriber albums a year. Yeah. So I'm way over the top of that and I'm not going great. And now you can give me more money. What I'm doing is saying, Every time I produce something that I think is of value, I'm going to put it out. Yeah. I'm going to tell you the story of it so that there's this kind of additional value. Because again, that's the thing with Spotify and even, I mean, YouTube, you've got a, a section where you can put, you know, a kind of a description, yeah. but I don't know how many people read it. That with Bandcamp, I can include a PDF that has a massive long story about how it's done. Yeah. I can include, I can keep posting pictures of the gear and, and the process along the way. So there's this build up to it. It's, 
So I, it's, I've been thinking about this a lot recently and how it's actually, in a sense, I use it almost more like a podcast. Yeah. But where every episode is a finished album. So we have this pull back to the age of the album where the album was this totemic uh, item that, you know, and for people of our age, we, well, certainly my age, we picked up the record and it was, you know, or the CD and it was a thing that you held and it had uh, a meaning over and above the piece of plastic. Yeah. That, that, and when you were, the experience of music wasn't just listening to it, it was holding that thing and remembering what it means to you. Reading the liner notes, reading the lyrics, exactly. the, whole bit, the experience of it. Yeah. And the artwork and all that. And so I, so the, again, Bandcamp allows me to spend time doing those kind of things. I can, I can do separate artwork for every track if I want. Um, I've just been watching, I don't know if you've been following the story of its kind of release, but Brian Bella has just finished his, yes, his, yeah, yeah. Finished his new record Scenes from the Flood and every track has its own artwork and its own story and its own, and he's been putting up bio, biographical information about the different musicians he's working with. But all of that for him is going on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram mm. because it's, he's got this, I mean, he spent a ridiculous amount of money making this record and he needs to recoup all of that. Yeah. And, and to be fair to him, you know, because of the work with Satriani and Death Clock and the aristocrats, he has this very much wider net to cast than I do. Yeah. I think I don't, I, I just, I just, I can't see a world in which I'm going to find the, 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 the size of audience outside of this kind of micro patronage model that allows me to keep doing what I do. I think the um, only way that that, uh, because you, because you have carved your own niche in a mm, way, it's, mm. it's a very, um, it, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't occupy any of the space of any of the other, let's say, solo <laughs> bass players, yeah, I mean, yeah. the victors of this world and all that. It's a very different thing. And it's almost like, um, like I keep saying, it, it's very cinematic. I mean, that's the, that's the standard comparison that people will make, that it's very cinematic. Mm. You've got these big soundscapes and stuff. And it's, it's almost like, you know, when you were saying about like the Satriani and aristocrat mm. side of, of Brian Bella, you're the way that you would do that would be through film music or computer games yeah, or something yeah. like that well, that'd be that type of audience well weirdly i'm just i'm working on a on a, or collaborating on a, a theater score as soon as we finish this conversation i'm diving into recording a, a set of one minute cues and links and transitions for a theater product, a production of macbeth um and i've been and, and i was put in touch with the sound designer by one of the actors in the play and uh they were kind of looking at, at uh uh, uh, kind of ways of sort of building the sound for this thing and and mm. my friend Lucy went actually you need to talk to Steve because he yeah. does that and it was and so this is it may well be that I end up doing that but this the, again it, it's that thing of I don't I don't want to write film soundtracks I've got friends who are film composers and I know yeah. what's required to in terms of you basically give your life over to the project it's, yeah. it's epically well paid eventually if you get a big film but like I, that, clearly doing this, that's not my concern. I wouldn't yeah, be yeah, doing yeah. what I'm doing if my concern was was trying to exactly you know, yeah. make out like a bandit from it all. And, and then so of course, the improvisation, so the improvisatory side of what you do, you would kind of be having to tailor that to whatever the visual is. So you would be losing yeah. some of that, you know, that pureness that you have. So I would, uh, yeah, I, maybe I'll push back against the word pure in a minute, but we'll come back to that. Um, but the the um, the one thing I'm loving about this is that I'm actually sending improvised work to the sound designer and then, and then she's doing the shaping. And, right, I, and okay. I've, I've, I've always done that as a, as a, as a, like I've done songwriting like that before. And I did a couple of years ago, I did a track with Tanya Donnelly, who was the singer in belly and yeah, I mean, yeah. still is the singer in belly. So, you know, sold literally a million records in the eighties, uh, in the nineties, sorry. And I met her because her sister is Kristen Hirsch. She's a solo artist in the singer with the three muses. And I know, I knew Kristen through helping her organize a gig in London, 15 years ago or something um and i met tanya at a gig and she she went and bought my back catalog and went let's do a thing together and so she said send me something and we'll see what happens and i my contribution to this song literally took 15 minutes right including uploading it to dropbox i sat down i played a chord progression where i didn't know what i was going to play after the first chord i didn't have it wasn't like work something out then hit record it was hit record and then work it out so I played this thing through. It's about just under three minutes long. I went, oh, I think I can probably do a slide thing like that. So I don't know, you'll have seen that I quite often play slide on my lap. Yeah, it's... <laughs> <laughs> right. 
So I did a slide part that was kind of sort of atmospheric and not like a big melodic kind of country thing like that, but it's sort of an atmospheric spooky thing. Added that to it, went, let's see what she thinks of that, dragged it into Dropbox and sent her the link and forgot about it. I, expecting her to come back and go, oh, okay, uh, maybe we'll make that the chorus section and can you make the first section like that, that whatever that first chord is, make that last longer. You know, just the kind of back and forth that happens in yeah. songwriting. And she just went, no, that's great. And so she sang over the top and added some sparkles and that was it. But do you prefer playing in the studio or live in terms of what you do? Uh, oh, that's a really good question. I mean, I, I, my, my, my ideal, again, just to be annoying, my, my, my ideal situation, it will be in the studio with an audience. Um, right. <laughs> cause, cause, because I love the acoustic side of being in the studio. I love the sound of it. Having said that, in the studio, I can't have headphones on. Yeah. So I'm in control of it that way. Um, but there is something about making music in people's homes that makes it feel like there's some sort of, I don't know, almost like it's a sacrament, like we've come together for this purpose and there's yeah. some sort of higher thing going on there. I don't want to make it spiritual, but certainly metaphysical. And, and, and there's also a breakdown in people's expectations that when people go to a gig, the venue is a huge part of their expectation. Yeah. And but a recent, so there's a recent massive audience uh, uh, study survey done by some academics up in Sheffield. And one of the things they found is that people are actually uh, as loyal to venues, if not more so than they are to bands. Right. So they okay. will go to specific venues and they will go, so they will be on the mailing list for a venue and go to gigs at that venue. I know, I remember hearing about a thing in Birmingham when Chris Cornell played here solo, uh, um, that some insane percentage of the audience had never heard of sound god yeah <laughs> they were there because of the venue which was the uh um uh symphony hall which is kind of has its own cachet and bond like he'd done a bond theme yeah yeah but it wasn't like it wasn't three thousand sound garden fans piling in no it was a thousand sound garden fans and fifteen hundred people went, Oh, we sang a bond theme. And well, it's I think- at the symphony hall, and that's lovely. And so for me, for doing the doing house concerts, all of that is out the window. This is not anybody's favorite venue, but it's everybody's favorite place to be. Hey, well, it, I was gonna say it's like you get an emotional attachment to the actual to the place, the yeah. you know, and the vibe. So uh, same thing with the venue, I suppose. If you're used yeah. to a certain, you know, your local where at village hall for instance you yeah, know yeah. you might have had wonderful times there and then you, you and if they start doing gigs you're like yeah 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 and d- like you say in your own home you've got an emotional attachment to it an instant emotional attachment to it so i have so i have a venue just up the road like literally a mile away from my house called tower of song and you'll discover as you go back through the through the the uh band camp uh subscription that i've recorded something like seven live albums there like right. it's is this amazing space it's like it feels like you should walk in and there should be people in cowboy hats with like kind of carrying <laughs> unconcealed yes. weapons, you know, like it's, it, it's a breeze block building on the edge of a, a edge of a trading estate. And yeah. yet you walk in and the, the mural on the wall is Bob Dylan's giant face and Lennon and Janis Joplin and Lead Belly and Charlie Parker and, and, and Coltrane. And there's this extraordinary space that you're in and there's a tiny bar in the corner that's dirt cheap. There's no gaming machines, there's no TVs, there's no karaoke, there's no tribute bands. It's just this artist-led space for people to do interesting stuff. And a lot of that is singer-songwriters, but I get to take my weird nonsense in there. And uh, and I love it. And that and that feels almost like a house concert because, again, it's it's this open space that, despite it being built as a venue, people, people come in and are like, what the hell is going to happen here? Like it doesn't yeah, yeah. tell you anything. Like there, there's no stage. Like the 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 band and the audience are on the same level. So yeah. I get to talk, and if I don't have a mic, it doesn't matter. Like I can just go, "Hello, how are you all?" this this thing where i want people to be able to see what i'm doing because i know there are tons of people who are fascinated by the mechanics of it and i love kind of having that kind of gaggle of bass players and, and producers going 
what's going on there? Can I see your patches on your on your mod duo and kind of wanting to do that? And I've never hidden behind any of that. Like I've never described any of this as frippatronics or you know those sort of yeah, made up yeah. words that people come up with to stop you from knowing what the tech is. Yeah, like yeah. I, I'm constantly publishing pictures of and circuit diagrams of how I do what I do, and posting the patches from the mod duo onto their website for people to share. Yeah, because as soon as you get caught into the idea that you have this one trick that is what makes what you do significant. Like I just go, that's nonsense. Like it's when people, like, I mean, who was it? Uh, was it Jeff Belen who used to go on about not playing for Atlas because you might sound like Jacko? Yes, yeah, you might sound like Jacko, yeah. And I'd be like, I wish it was that easy. Like yeah. you know, just up your fellow space. <laughs> Suddenly word of mouth comes out of you. Like to ignore the fact that Jacko's genius is that he was a, as a composer. I mean, he transformed the bass. But in a bigger sense, yeah. when you look, so the first album is a compilation. It's a showcase. Like it's let's let's show Jacko off being an R and B bass player. And so we'll do the song with Sam and yeah. Dave. And then there's a solo thing, and there's a bebop thing, and there's the the steel pan kind of what would then have been dismissed as world music kind of thing. And so yeah. it's it's a smorgasbord, and all of them are amazing. But it's clearly been put together by a record label to showcase what this guy can do. When you jump to word of mouth, you go here's somebody who is like like li literally one of the greatest arrangers and and yeah. composers of the jazz era like it it was there's like three views of a secret and uh two gemini's and all that kind of stuff there's just extraordinary pieces of work and the bass playing is almost incidental to what makes them great crisis completely is a choice i mean yeah. to, to do crisis as the opening tune on your record when what you've just done you so you just I, I, I can talk for this stuff, about this stuff for hours um uh, they just done Birdland and Teen Town, so they like the record label going, yeah, Fusion King, let's get him to do that. And yeah. Like, yeah, so the opening tune is chaos for like six minutes. Yeah, yeah. Everybody's playing over drum beat, but nobody can hear each other. Like it's it's free improv in that sense, and and that like to to get hung up on on the fretlessness of his bass, like to pick this minute, almost trivial aspect of what he did, <laughs> even though it was a transformative aspect in the grand scheme of what makes Jacko sound like Jacko, that's not it. Because yeah. portrait, portrait of Tracy is on a fretted bass. Yeah, Come on, come over is on a fretted bass. Like, like his signature tunes are are fretted tunes. And you like, would never dream of comparing necessarily Mick Khan with with Jekyll. No, no, completely exactly, different world. Exactly. Or Nick Beggs. Or yeah. Michael. I mean, Michael Manning started out as a Jacko clone. The first Michael's first Wyndham Hill record is like you can hear that he's just been studying with Jacko. And yeah. It's like, let's take that sound and put it into the world of Will Ackerman and Michael Hedges. But but he evolved incredibly quickly and technically went so far beyond anything that Jacko did, like just in terms of the expanding it. I think Jacko did what he did exceptionally well. Yeah. But it, it's a pretty limited set. It's why people are still going on about Jacko and needed four strings. And you go, well, isn't that on him? Like, like he clearly could do what he wanted to do with that. But he didn't go that far down that route because he was, you know, his life was tragically ended yeah. at a point when he could have emerged as someone else. And there's all these these conversations we can have about what people would have done. I've just been watching the Voodoo Child documentary on, uh, yeah, on the, the uh, Hendrix thing. Yeah. And you, I, I, you know, I, I, most of the time I avoid talking about music from the past. Like I don't, I, it's just, it just feels like there's so little attention given to music. Now everybody yeah. else is doing the talking about where music was. I'm going to focus my conversations on what's happening now. So let's get into <laughs> effects, right? So, yeah. I know that you get some crazy sounds out of some of that yeah. stuff, but some of it is a lot more simple than mm. I was than I thought it would be. So <laughs> I noticed on a video you did recently, or whenever it was, and you were talking about the Hall of Fame reverb, oh, yeah, yeah. and I was like, I cannot believe that a lot of that's that the big pad mm -hmm. sounds that you get are yeah. simply that on its own. Well, that's the thing. So there was, there was, I was the, the, I was the Hall of Fame mini as well. It's like the the sixty yeah. quid version. I, I I spent a whole ton of like this is the thing that I get deep inside what any pedal or box will do. I'm at the moment like so the mod duo is my is my multi effects of choice, and it's I, I like I, I I before that I used my Lexicon MPXG two for twenty years, and it's the first thing that came I came along where I went. This is the next step up. Like I I saw the Axe effects and went nah. Saw the Helix nah. Saw this and went, yeah, okay, that's the business. <laughs> because it's like the wiring possibilities are so absurdly complex. Like, you, yeah. like there's no there's no kind of single path thing to it at all. It's more like the old even tied H9000. Like it's that yeah. sort of where you just have a screen with a bunch of stuff on it and connect it up in any way you want. But 
because I push everything to its limits, I'm at the point now where I'm chatting with their developer going, okay, this keeps happening. What have I broken? And I keep I keep installing beta plugins. Like they have this whole think community thing where people can write plugins for it. And I put them all in there. And like whenever there's a new version of the software, I, I download it and, and I've got the beta version software. So I, it keeps crashing. But that's entirely on me like because there is a stable version of it. But do I keep wanting just, to push beyond it. But do you just, I mean, do you just throw a lot of it together sometimes and think, right, let's see what happens? Mm-hmm. Because yeah, I, all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's absolutely. Because there was a, um, th- I remember, was uh, when was it? It was like, <laughs> there you go. It was about, I, I can't remember how many London based shows back it was. It may be, it was the one where you opened up that morning doing um, one of your, master classes and you did a performance okay. there i think because i was blown away by the fact that the music before was coming from the aguilar the uh oh yes when i, when I played the, the the jeff buckley tune to the speech that's Aguilar's. it yeah because yeah, that, that was funny because because like three people went and bought the exact same setup the same day. yeah i did like, I, <laughs> I, <laughs> I uh i couldn't believe it but then i uh you were playing one of your pieces yeah. and there was like i who knows what effects were going on? There was something crazy going on in there. Yeah. And you had like, um, there was some form of overdrive stroke distortion, whatever it could yeah. be, probably some weird bit cruncher kind of <laughs> thing going on. And then there was something else. And from that, there was almost like this interaction where there yeah. was like some weird overtones coming out. Yeah. And I was like, man, this isn't, it wasn't like you were, it wasn't the notes that you were playing. You weren't playing harmonics. You weren't doing anything yeah. like that. And I asked you afterwards, I said, "Is were, were you playing harmonics or something in there? And you were like, no, it was just the interaction of these effects yeah, just yeah, happening. Yeah. It's almost like some, just, you know, just by chance that happens and it becomes what? a part of the overall, you know, improvisation. So, some of that was, uh, so, so, the, so the, the, just the specifics of that patch on the Hall of Fame is that I've said it. So there's, there's a modulation thing on there where you can get basically a yeah. chorus on it. And you can set that so it just it starts picking harmonics. And I don't think I don't know if it's designed to do that. I don't know if that was a thing where they went, let's have a modulation that does harmonics. But I managed to get this setting that did it. And so when I dined, because the, the Hall of Fame Mini has one control on it, uh, but you can assign if you've got the app, you can assign yeah. anything to that one thing. So so as you pan through it, I've got five or six things on a graph all doing that as it kind of sweeps through the thing. Because again, like why not? Um, but when you get to the top. There is this kind of modulation that goes Wah! and it sings out. But I also you can do it with distortion as well. So um so that's that's a bit loud, isn't it? Hang on. Uh, let me pull up the touch. Uh, if you put two distortions together, so that's a tube overdrive in the mod duo and the Aguilar Agro. <laughs> suddenly they're starting to interact in a kind of slightly strange way. And if I put a fuzz before that, so that's the MXR sub-octave bass fuzz. Yeah. Which if I put the octave in with that, these are all fairly traditional sounds in in the the original, but then you combine them. And it sounds like they're about to squeal at any moment. And then, this is where the magic happens. I've got a, a, an MXR, um, sorry, Dunlop Crybaby Mini Bass Wire, which yeah. is after the fuzz, but before the two overdrives. Yeah, and all of a sudden that's that. And then if you do that, and then so this is this last the last bit for this particular demo. I'm going to stick the uh, um, MXR modulating reverb on this. So it's just the MXR reverb pedal, which has like six. Seconds. So yeah, and so that, so it's a combination of of all kind of it's all natural ingredients, yeah, um, of of things that that in and of themselves are are quite normal, and I can make them sound normal. But then when you interact with them, when you start to get this, one of the reasons why I have pedals at hand height is that I want to be able to mess with them and not have the same thing over and over again. 
which I guess is key to the way that I use gear. I'm doing, so I'm doing a masterclass at the, the London Bay show uh, in a couple of weeks time about pedals. And one of the key things I'm going to be talking about is that your whole approach to this stuff changes when you don't have to recreate the same songs. Like I never have to play my stuff again. If I did, and I was having to save settings for things, like when you see, I don't know, like Guthrie Govan's pedal board and it's like a gig rig thing on three different yeah. levels and it looks like a multi-story car park for pedals that have just kind of yeah. lined up. And, and it's all, then he has all those kind of settings saved in a digital thing so that you can use analog pedals, but recall exactly the same signal path. That makes sense because he's playing tunes night after night and he's an yeah. improviser, but he's improvising within the context of a song that has certain sounds attached to it. For me, I don't want the same sounds on the next record that I had on the last. In terms of effects, like, because you've got such a, it's, I suppose you could call it a reliance on effects. I mean, you've got, it's, yeah. it's a part yeah. of your whole personality. Um, does that ever put added pressure on for things to be right when you actually... Well, again, again, it's, it's back to the, the, the affordance of being an improviser. So I had a gig in Belfast last weekend at the Belfast Guitar Festival. I was headlining the bass night. And uh, a, a bunch of things started crapping out, like at various points in it. Like that that problem with the, the mod duo, like not yeah. loading the next pedal board and things um, because of my absurd habit of upgrading the software the day before a gig. Um, <laughs> uh and so it was. So that was happening. And uh, and and but and if I'd been playing tunes, it would have ruined them because it was improv. I just did other things. So I would kind of go, "Oh, there's no sound there, right?" Well, I'll play piano on the cue. <laughs> I can do that. So I can make that happen in a second. Uh, um, uh, and I, you know, so I would kind of go, "Great." Well, I'll just I'll play piano for a bit while that reloads. And so I'd hit a chord with one hand and unplug that with the other one and plug it back in and then carry on. And so actually, when I listen back to the recording of it. Like there's some lovely moments that are much more sparse than they would have been if the pedal hadn't gone down. Yeah. Like I would have been filling them up with stuff. Like there's, so back to the thing about my first album, there's, the, on that, I didn't have a way of, of fading loops out. Like I had a, a volume pedal after the looper, but it was in the main signal path. So I could only fade down to nothing. So there's a moment in one of the tunes where I've got all this stuff going and these loops and this chord progression. I want to go into a, to a completely ambient thing. But in order to do that, I needed to fade that slowly down to nothing. Everything has to stop while I very, very quickly delete all of those loops, fade it back in and start playing and start recording again, which was kind of crazy tap dance, but also gave the piece this amazing flow that kind of goes up and down and then back up again. And nowadays, that would be coming down while this was coming up. So I would fill in that gap. And that, again, that has its own beauty. And there is this kind of a loveliness to being able to do transitions, almost like a kind of crossfade. Yeah. And I can do that with the loop relative. But I, I need to, I could, at times I need a reminder that actually that level of space can be really lovely. And it normally happens when I've, got, when I've got a really long set to do. And I'm not thinking about doing seven, eight, nine, 10 minute pieces. I'm thinking about doing 25 minute pieces. And I can go, actually, I can do the first five minutes. This can just be this big ambient sound and I can let it flow around the room and yeah. see what happens. And, and everybody can kind of adjust to that and kind of get, ah, okay, well, it's going to be like this, is it? And then I can throw in weird shit and surprise them. That's uh, that, that rumble is a sample as well. Um, yeah. Why is it still rumbling? It should have stopped right now. There it is. So I can play piano on there. So that's what that's I will awesome. do in between, which is just, I don't even see that one here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can, yeah. So you see the Kenya. Um, I've yeah, so it's just... The sample, uh, triggering the samples off there with the thunder and all the, yeah, yeah. Uh, all the ambient sounds and things. Yeah. And and so, you so, so, hear so, that yeah. on the, uh, on one of the, I think it's on Arctic is Burning, uh, the, there's one of them and you can hear almost that crackle. Is it like almost ah, like a... There's a vinyl, vinyl crackle. crackle. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so there's, 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 that's on, that's, is it that one? Yeah, and it adds and comes, yeah. a really cool ambient feel to it. That that I, I have a couple. Just don't of, think of it. I have a couple of subscribers who hate it. It's really, really? funny. Like, like cause, but it's great because we have this conversation, and they don't. I, I never get them. This again is one of those beautiful things about the subscriber thing because it's a much flat, more flattened kind of hierarchy, and it happens in a private space. Like it's just the subscriber space. So there's no kind of grand gesture of being, I'm going to take this guy down. Like YouTube comments, people are trying to take you down. You'll have had yeah, this, yeah. you know, people are like, I can prove this guy is, is yeah. bullshit. 
And that doesn't happen in the subscriber thing because A, people have paid to be there and B, yeah. like it just it just isn't set up like that. So when they when somebody goes, oh, I really I'm just not into that vinyl fake vinyl crackle, like why would you do that? And then someone else goes, actually, I love it because it feels more like hip hop. And this interesting conversation happens, but at no point does any of them go, you should do this. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I, outside of that, from people who've never bought anything of mine, I get, you know what you should do? It's a kind of Harry Enfield thing. Yeah. You don't want to do that. You want to play bass like this. You want to write some funk tunes and sound like Bootsy. And it's like, yeah, I'd love to sound like Bootsy. (laughs) The God. But no, that's not going to happen. Now, lastly, I was going to ask you about um, your teaching as well, because you do a lot of master classes. I mean, I've seen you quite a few times doing that. You've you're um, one of the main guys over at SBL um, doing a lot of your. It's mainly effect stuff that you talk about and improvisation, isn't it, over at SBL? Yeah, I've also done. I've done done three courses for Scott. I've done looping, pedals, and fretless. And I think all three of them are due for a, for a second volume at some point. Um, yeah. I hope. Uh, I want to do. I want. I want to do an improv one. I see. I've kind of because because whenever I do a talk about improv, like as part of the kind of weekly seminar thing, people go, "Oh God, this should be a course." But I do that, and I've got the column for in Bass Guitar Magazine, which I'm in the middle of writing. Like I wrote the first half before we started talking, and I'll finish it as soon as we finished. And you um, at BIM as well, don't you? I teach at BIM in Birmingham. Yeah, which is amazing. Like an extraordinary place to, to teach. As, as somebody there described it, it's a twat-free zone. Like there were just no <laughs> arseholes that work there. Like it's the most amazing. Wow, moment. that's a change. Like, no, it's, yeah, in music. Imagine that. Like being yeah. in a music situation where that like there's nobody that I've met through BIM that is cynical that is there because they couldn't get a gig doing something else yeah, there are yeah. people with extraordinary experience and some amazing musicians i mean i've said that, that that my immediate kind of teaching team at kidderminster were like that that's how i met uh, andy edwards and fayan zek and we formed ley lines was that we were the bass drums and guitar and andy runs yeah. the course there and that's a great course too i just this year i just cut back on all my teaching last year i was teaching at coventry uni as well and I, because I'm in the middle of a PhD, or and, and I should be at the end of a PhD, like I'm, I'm, I'm about eighteen months behind where I should be, and so I've got six months in which to get that written, like at least up to the point of of just writing up my actual research, and that's all about my audience and improv and the subscription and all that kind of stuff. That's all in there, so it, it's great fun because it's it's not a thing I'm ever going to lose interest in, but it's an awful lot of work, and so I've kind of had to back off on that. And the same with private teaching, like I. I have, a very, I mean, sometimes I, I've, in my life, I've been doing 30 to 40 hours a week of private tuition. Yeah. Um, and these days I do very little. And it's, and it's kind of because I just, I've got to, I've got to write. I've got to get on with that. Like today, I've got this conversation with you, which has just been fantastic fun. Um, I've got my column to write. I've got to record those bits of music for that theater production. Yeah. And then I need to sit down and go, right, what do I need to do on this PhD? Because, and I have a, a wife and a child, and, yeah. you know. And, that takes up and, enough time. And a new record that came out this week that I, that needs me to be constantly pushing. And and, and it has, it's funny because because of that we're living in this kind of political hellscape that it, we're like, we're like at the, at the hell mouth in Buffy and all of these horrific demons are pouring out of it and getting jobs in politics that, that because of all of that, like people putting records out are kind of getting lost in that conversation and understandably so. Like, I think it's much more important that people are dealing with the fact that, that there's, there are those sort of scale of inequalities and nonsense going on in the world, but it does make it difficult. Like, like I put out, um, Beauty and Desolation this time last year, almost exactly the same time last year. And it must have been in a lull in Brexit for some reason, because yeah. it was <laughs> yeah. it was massive news. Like, and it, and, it, and it sold better than anything I'd done in a decade. And the reaction to the new one from everybody who's heard it has been, wow, this is, you've taken that even further. Like it's, it's been, like there's been, I've had emails of people going, I have genuinely no idea. How, I've just watched you do it. And I still have no idea how that happened. That's extraordinary. And that's lovely. But, like it hasn't, it hasn't connected on that same scale. And again, like, like again, social media becomes such a random thing that, that no trouble did two posts about it, which was lovely. Last year they did an interview with me about it. That can reach that, that can be the difference between an audience of 10 and an audience of 10,000. Yeah. If 
based musician magazine. Raoul's been offering to, to interview me for ages and he hasn't, we haven't had a chance to do anything with that. But again, that's another one where that could reach a ton of people. But it could also be just the way I word a tweet can make people yeah. go, oh man, I need to do that. Like it's, it's amazing this is, a, this how that is the odd. Yeah, and you'll, you'll know this, that, you know, sometimes you'll describe a new video that's come out in a way and you'll go, you'll just hit it right. Yeah. And your audience goes, I have to see that. And you'll suddenly, you'll have 10,000 views in a couple of days instead of 2,000 views in a couple of days. And you go, and it makes no sense because yeah, the wording, yeah. you, there's no way of predicting that at all. No, it's like complete no. chaos. And you just don't know how that's going to work. But I mean, I, but, it, I, but, it imp- but for you and I, it impacts our bottom line. Yeah. And, you know, and we, and we kind of go, I'm trying to second guess what that's going to be. And there are people who work in marketing who will charge you to do that for you, but not be in any way responsible for the effectiveness of what they do. Yeah. So we are day to day paid or not paid based on how well we can predict that stuff and do it. Well, I think um, the uh, latest one on Arctic scary. is burning is, um, you know, like when you were saying that it, it's been a 20 year or 25 year mm. journey from mm. that first solo album up to this, you can, I can, hear it as a, a kind of apex when it when it gets to that oh, because it, it seems to have this cohes- cohesiveness cohesion i don't know that uh, that i'm um, not that the, any of the others don't but it really hit me as i was as i was listening to it and it's there's a kind of continuity running through the mm. whole thing and uh, yeah i i think it's a it, it masterpiece it came, really it, thank you so much i mean it came together really easily like like normally I end up with a second album of other, of other stuff that goes with it. And this time I put out a bunch of that beforehand. There's an album called Stepping Stones. It's a subscriber only one that kind of leads up to it. And there were two things on there that I think are some of the best things I've ever done. There's a tune mm. called D, uh, DT Divinity and Daniel, which is about my two of my biggest influences. Yeah. David Torn, Divinity, who the reason I do all this, this drum stuff is entirely her. Oh, like, right. Divinity like Rocks, we, yeah. we were, we were working on a duo project here and she pulled out a drum, uh, a keyboard and started playing drums in the middle of us recording, like it was just, like it was nothing. And she just pulled this keyboard that she dragged around with her everywhere out, plugged it in and started to loop that in her looper along with beatbox and bass. And I was just like, what witchcraft is this? This is extraordinary. She's an <laughs> unbelievable musician, like just, yeah, she's just incredible. Mad yeah. skills and this amazing energy. And then Daniel Berkman, who I did a 10 album set with, like, <laughs> uh, seven or eight years ago we did a bunch of gigs and then released every single note that we'd ever played together there's some more of that coming out soon but he you know he and he played this very this same controller and hand sonic which is an electronic percussion instrument and cora and and and, and he transformed my performance thing that when we were doing when we were doing the tour together i was still playing tunes so although everything that he and i did together was improv within the set we would both do a solo tune and i would play a tune off what was then my current album, which was 11 Reasons Why Three is Better Than Everything. And I think I was doing either, I think it was Traveling North was the tune that I was doing uh, in each gig. And when I listened back to it, it was like quite significantly the low point of every gig. It was my <laughs> tune. Because it was just like, <sighs> like, yeah. Yeah, like it'd gone from this incredibly high level improv that was designed for the room. This is the thing about improv and particularly with house concerts you're making a soundtrack to, the, to that room. You're, yeah. The people in the audience are in the music. They're embedded in it. You're looking at their faces and that's changing what you play. Like they're the score that you're, that you're reading and playing. Yeah. And so there's all this stuff happening at 11 and then there's like this energy <laughs> slump when I go, and now a song so I can sell some music. Like it's yeah. just, you just, I, I listened to it and it's like, man, I need to never ever do that again. Like I just, I'm, <laughs> like that's not ever. So these days, if I do a tune, it's it's i'll pull out a cover because it's either something that i don't know very well and it's kind of fun to kind of do i did i did uh a version of isn't she lovely you know the victor thing the, yeah yeah a, a gig a while back and like you'll hear it. it's on it's on one of those subscriber album called the, the dudley bug which was a live thing i recorded in dudley and uh it's on there and uh and I play that. I, I play it, but I kind of get lost halfway through. It's great, and it's. And I, I put it out because it was funny on this live album. Um, um, but yeah, like so, I occasionally do that. But I, I tend to do things. I don't. I, I'll pull them out because I feel like I need to connect with the audience. Yeah. Like, and, but that can even be like five notes. There was a bit in the middle of a, the thing I did in Belfast where I just played like a love supreme. Do 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 do. And the organizer's eyes lit up and he's like, I know that because you just, 
play three notes and it invites people in. Yeah. One of the ones that I that I do, I haven't done it in a while actually, but I'll occasionally just go. Yeah. I'll just play a little bit from Wish You Were Here. Is it Wish yeah. You Were Here? Oh, no, uh, uh, Shining You Crazy Diamond, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that first chord, that just... Which and all actually, the Floyd fans are like, woo! <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you just kind of do that and you even hint at it and then I'll look up and go... Yeah. <laughs> and you've got people back on side. People who kind of had previously kind of because again, if people come to a gig, we all bring expectations to shows. You've had, you'll have had that thing where you buy a record by somebody based on what somebody else has told you about it. Yeah. And they got it completely wrong. And you're like, well, it's not that. Yeah. Yeah. And it takes you the effort of coming back to it to go, actually, but what is it? Oh, well, what it is is amazing. Yeah. Like one of my favorite artists ever is Bruce Coburn, mm. a Canadian singer songwriter. Yeah. But the first album of his I got, I was like, wow, this is rubbish. What's this? This isn't what I was expecting. Yeah. And now that album I absolutely adore. But it was like, it was somebody had told me what it was meant to be. I built this picture in my head of what he was going to be. And then I heard it and went, no, I don't want any of that bollocks. And uh, and and so that can happen at gigs as well. People show up with an idea of what's happening and they just kind of like, they want something they know. Yeah. And and I'm not, I, you know, and I, and I I'm not a belligerent improviser. It's not a matter of me going, no, you must put up with this harsh noise for an hour. I don't mind playing harsh noise for an hour, <laughs> but there are times when I do that. And there are times when it does get a little bit confrontational, I guess. But for the most part, my, my purpose is to make meaning to music. Like I want to soundtrack what's going on. And I want there to be a moment when me and the people in the room and what's, what, the space itself and what's going on in the world come together and people go okay this 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 is somehow like makes sense of what's going on like this yeah. is i feel like things are okay for a moment uh, which is kind of quite a big ask like to yeah. do that it's like so i want it to be entertaining i want it to be fun i want it to be inspiring to the musicians particularly in the audience i kind of like it when people go wow i want to go and do that and i like there being the story about it but there's also as you can see on the arctic is burning there is this kind of big thing where i'm reflecting on how things are in the world and the fact that we're in this weird situation where some things are better than they've ever been. You know, I mean, the, 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 the some things about us having had the internet for 20 odd years are amazing. And some of them are utterly dystopian and it could be the death yeah. of us all. And that I can't imagine making music without that stuff in mind. I can't imagine going, well, I'm just going to play party tunes. Yeah. Did, talking to party tunes. Here's a, here's a, 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 my, my weird tidbit for the, for the, for the week is that I discovered that, um, Celebrate by Cool and the Gang. Yeah, was written by uh, I think it's I think it's Cool the Robert Cool Bell I think is a is a Muslim and it was written as part of his kind of morning devotional reading of the Quran. Really? That, so that is so so when you get mad like American right wing rednecks at yeah, weddings yeah. in America singing along to that they're singing an Islamic hymn of praise <laughs> and not realizing it, <laughs> which is. Just the most brilliant piece of, like, what a mad piece of information I know, to have. That's brilliant. That, 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 that celebrate by calling the gang is is a, is inspired by the Quran. It makes me it makes me want to go and listen to it more. I want to kind of go, yeah, I want to I want to soak that in. Mm. I want to yeah, yeah. I want to hear what that means within the context of that music, and I want to go kind of go hear the celebration in it as more than just we can make some money out of writing funk, but actually going no, I, there's there's a there's a a heart bursting thing to this and it's back to the thing about victor of joy you know that yeah the, he has rhythm and he has groove and he has but he also has joy joy yeah, yeah when that when that's not because i think there are things he's done that don't have that that do labor and in the same way that all of us yeah miss our kind of you know central thing occasionally i think i do yeah um i know i do um and there are moments on victor's records when that's not there and that just makes it all the more apparent when it is and when you see him live, there are going to be gigs where he's tired and, it, that, and that's not as prevalent as it is. And then you see him when he's really on it and you go, my God, that's one of the most amazing things anybody's ever done with, with a band. I think that's why people like Stevie Wonder are so revered because of that sort of inherent joy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the fact that Stevie can write songs about his kids and we, we not hate them. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, like people, there's that truism that people's divorce record is their best. Yeah, and yeah. And their their record about their kids is their worst. Like, yeah. 
because who the hell wants to hear somebody singing about how cute their kids are? But isn't she lovely? Is amazing. Yeah. But I mean, even has a kid yeah. crying at the beginning of it. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, most completely. sickly of tropes. The thing where yeah. you just anybody else you'd want to punch them in the face. Yeah. Uh, Stevie went, no, Stevie, bring it on. Yeah, yeah. Bring on that syrup. <laughs> we're all we're all about that. It's amazing because it's just uh, he's Stevie and it's amazing and he can do yeah. that. So where can people find you then? So the, obviously Bandcamp. Mm-hmm. So yeah, well, well, it's so. I mean, the, the, I suppose the portal to it all is SteveLawson.net. Like, I still have a website. Like, I'm hanging on. Like, it still matters, yeah. and it does. Like, I recently redesigned it, and it's it's an um, hopefully a really useful space to kind of go and get all of that gig dates and record releases and blog and all that stuff. Yeah. And so that that then links to Bandcamp and and, and music.stevelawson.net, which is the sort of subdomain within it. That is actually Bandcamp. Like that's that's yeah. a that's a that's a URL that redirects to Bandcamp. So music.stevelawson.net. But I'm I, I'm around and about on on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and they're all solo based Steve. But yeah, I'm you know come and find me, email me, send me a message. Um, <clears throat> I'm up for talking to people, and I'll be at the London Bass Guitar Show in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, so depending on when this video goes out, I guess. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, I'm kind of I'm around and about. Come and see me play, Steve Lawson. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs>